Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Leesk, and I am pleased to be uh, speaking with you all. Um, I really appreciate that uh, you've tuned in for this, and I hope you find my presentation very interesting. So, what is financial independence? Um, I think the most important takeaway here is that that is very much subject to uh, each of our own interests. Um, for some people, it's being able to go out and eat food with friends. For some of us, it's having a really nice house or a really nice car. Um, for some of us, it's travel, uh, maybe something more of adventure, being able to uh, go scuba diving with sharks, for example, um, as well as uh, maybe just spending time with our families and being able to provide for them. So it really is. Um, a matter of person to person, and that's how we define financial independence. So um, here's a quote from a, a famous author. Uh, he was also a libertarian candidate for president um, several decades ago, and he wrote a book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And I like this quote a lot. He was talking about freedom in general, but I think that uh, this applies quite well to financial independence. Um, so his quote is, freedom is the opportunity to live your life as you want to live it. So again, very subjective. Each of us probably defines it in a slightly different way. Um, so let's get a little bit more in detail there. Um, so wealth is relative. Um, here I've actually included two examples of uh, two, I guess, by most standards, very wealthy individuals, uh, Warren Buffett and Mike Tyson. Um, but first all, I'll mention Warren Buffett. Uh, for a long time, he was the wealthiest uh, person in the world. Um, I guess up there these days, he's tied with both, uh, or not tied, but he goes back and forth between technically Vladimir Putin, as well as perhaps uh some of these uh, wealthier sheiks in the Middle East. Um, and then last year, Elon Musk as well became a competitor. But um, for the sake of this presentation, we'll call Warren Buffett the wealthiest individual in the world. And his net worth is currently at $113 billion. Um, Warren Buffett famously uh, bought his house, I guess something like 60 years ago or 70 years ago even. Um, that's a picture of his house there. He still lives there. Um, he's very famously frugal as well, uh, which is the relevance of, of showing that um, he's still in that same house that he bought uh, so long ago. Mike Tyson, on the other hand, even though he's worth 10 million today, um, you can see a couple of these news clippings um, where in 2003, he actually filed for bankruptcy. Um, down there, you can see Tyson earned nearly 300 million, um, I believe over the course of his whole career, uh, this article is from 2003, but over the course of his career from fights and all that, he made over 400 million. Um, and even after making all that money, he still had to declare bankruptcy. Um, now he's made a lot of it back, lots of different um, deals he's made since then. Um, but the point being, it doesn't matter how much money you make. What matters is what you do with it and how uh, responsible you are with it. You can see some pictures of his quite lavish home in Las Vegas as well. OK, so before moving on, um, the majority of the presentation is going to be on personal finance um, and and how to, I guess, increase your wealth uh, in order to live a better life. But that can't be addressed without addressing uh, the Federal Reserve, but also um, central banks in general around the world. So here you can see two different charts, um, both using their respective kind of consumer price index um, from each of the countries. So you can see um, in the US going back to 2012, uh, pretty much hovering around 2%, which is famously the goal of the Federal Reserve um, for their inflation rate. Um, and then I've also included Nigeria's, 
where you can see quite a different uh, and quite variable inflation rate year after year. Um, I guess going as low as 8% around 2014 and as high as 19% uh, in around 2017. So the reason this is important is inflation uh, is really the Austrian economists like to call it the hidden tax um, on people's savings. Uh, so it erodes your money over time. So this is one huge factor um, when you're trying to achieve financial independence. You have to factor in inflation because it's a it's a hidden tax that slowly erodes at your wealth. OK, so how do you begin to accumulate your wealth? It's step by step. Um, you have to do what you can to minimize your expenses and to maximize your income. Uh, in doing so, you're on a very steady path to build that wealth. Uh, throughout the presentation, by the way, I've included several quotes that I like. Um, you might know some of the individuals that are quoted. You might not know others, but uh, I'm a huge fan of each of the people whom I quoted within this presentation. Uh, so this one's from Doug Casey. Individuals, like squirrels, are genetically wired to produce more than they consume. The difference between production and consumption can be saved. That creates capital. So that's the sweet spot. And even though it's quite simple um, in terms of concepts, uh, most people don't do this. And actually, Americans very famously take on lots and lots of debt um, so that we can, uh, I guess, live lives of uh, grandeur. Um, but this isn't a very good long term strategy. And uh, again, even though maybe we live, um, I don't know, lives with lots of luxury, um, the average American has zero savings and therefore is not uh, financially independent. Um, hugely concerning. And anytime a huge cost comes their way, um, and in many circumstances, it actually destroys Americans' lives. Um, so concept here is uh, produce more than you consume and you should be OK. OK, so Albert Einstein is known for many things uh, in the financial world. Uh, this is one quote that people like a lot, and that's the concept of compound interest, eighth wonder of the world. So compound interest, I won't explain. Uh, the mechanics of the formula or how that works. But here you can see what happens um, if you start out with $100 and each month for 40 years, you invest an additional $100. Um, and the assumption is that whatever you're investing in, you'll get an annual rate of return of about 10%. Uh, just for context, the S&P 500, people stay, and depending on where you look at the data, where you start, when you stop, but it's anywhere from 15 to 20 percent annual returns, um, which is why Warren Buffett suggests that most people should just invest in the S&P 500 and leave their money in it for uh, the duration of their lives uh, through retirement. But anyway, so here you can see $100, and you invest an additional $100 every month for 40 years assume an annual rate of 10%, and by the time you are 40, uh, no, excuse me, by the time 40 years have passed, that $100 has become $637,778. So that's a huge amount of money. Um, and I think the most important point about the compound interest is you can see that that curve doesn't get particularly steep till after about 30 years. So it's uh it takes a long time to get there it requires a lot of patience and consistent effort at making money but you can see that it can be done um you just have to be consistent hardworking, and diligent in your savings process um and this is the magic of, of compound interest okay so 
This quote is from a gentleman that you heard from yesterday, which is Per Beeland. Um, and this relates to opportunity cost. So Per describes opportunity cost as the fundamental trade-off in any choice to act. Um, that's a very sophisticated way of saying whenever you choose one uh, manner in which to act, uh, every other option that you had disappears. And that's the trade-off. So when you make one decision to pursue something, um, you can no longer pursue any of the other alternatives because you've made your choice. So how does that relate to um, financial independence? Well, here's another example, and this goes back to the compound interest thing, because there's a there's a famous example from Warren Buffett, and somebody I don't know if it's actually true, but this is this is the story. Um, somebody asked Warren Buffett why he wouldn't spend forty dollars on a pair of jeans, and he said, "Well, that's that's not a forty dollar pair of jeans. That's actually a one hundred thousand dollar pair of jeans." And you can see in this chart um, where he's coming from. This is, uh, you can see at year zero, uh, that you start with $40, which is that pair of jeans. But if you buy that pair of jeans for $40, the opportunity cost is what you could have done with that $40. Warren Buffett, who's very famous for his uh, long-term track record of successful investing, um, averages 20% annually. So 20%, that's a very excellent return uh, if you can manage to do it year after year, uh, which he has uh, on average. So this chart is, a, is showing compound interest, again, over 40 years, um, and starting with that $40 pair of jeans. And reinvesting that $40, um, excuse me, Starting with that $40 and having it compound over those 40 years uh, at 20% interest each year ends up at over $100,000 at the end of that time frame. So um, I guess next time someone asks you to, uh, I don't know, buy a nice lunch or a nice dinner or a nice pair of jeans, uh, maybe think twice and think about if maybe you should be putting that money to good use and investing it. OK, so here are a couple of other quotes um, on opportunity cost. This is from Ayn Rand, one of the great authors and philosophers um, in history. Uh, if you do not know her, I really encourage you to look her up. She was a fantastic woman. Um, so she says money is a great power because in a free or even a semi free society, it is a frozen form of productive energy and therefore the spending of money is a grave responsibility. Uh, the next gentleman is my dad, and uh, he summed up her rather sophisticated phrasing um, in a much easier to understand uh, three words, which is life isn't fair. And that's something that my dad would tell me when we were uh, at the store, typically the grocery store, and we would finish buying uh, the important stuff, the food. And then I would always insist on going down the toy aisle I'd see these $5, $6, uh, whatever they were, toys. I don't know what I was interested in when I was four. But I would say, Dad, I want this toy. And he'd say, yeah, that's that's cool. And I said, OK, can we get it? And he would say, no. And I'd say, but Dad, that's not fair. And he would say, life isn't fair. Um, now, in terms of opportunity cost, it may be a stretch, but I think he was indirectly saying, yes, we can buy this toy for six dollars, fine, but we can put this money to much better use. Um, now, six dollars, that's nothing, but six dollars combined with um, another lunch, another frivolous spending, et cetera, that all adds up. And again, going back to the Warren Buffett um, example with the jeans, maybe that six dollars should be put to better use than a silly toy that I'll probably stop using after a couple of days. OK. So what is an asset? Um, if you ask an accountant, they would tell you that an asset is basically any physical good um, 
possibly, I guess, digital and intellectual property, but that gets into a whole different concept. But um, Robert Kiyosaki uh, rephrases um, the definition of an asset and actually changes it uh, to make it easier for people to understand how they can really make money. Um, but he does use the accounting terms assets and liabilities to describe this. So he says the simple definition of an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. OK, fair enough. Um, so examples, rental properties. Why? Because they are properties and you derive income from those properties from the rent. Dividend paying stocks. Those are um, stocks that represent ownership of companies and by you holding them, um, you receive dividends from holding those stocks. So again, it's a it's a thing that you own and as a result of owning it, you actually derive income from it. Another one is businesses. Businesses are there to operate and receive revenue. Um, and books. Books, um, I guess it's a little bit of a stretch for how Robert Kiyosaki defines asset, but he uses this as an example. So, and I, I completely agree with it, which is that from books, you can learn a tremendous amount of knowledge, um, particularly from, basically it's like standing on the shoulders of giants from all these people that have lived their lives and learned and then written about it so that we can learn from them and, and stand on their shoulders and, and put to good use what they're teaching us. Um, and eventually, hopefully, you can implement those ideas and, uh, and make money from that. Uh, so here are three things that are, in fact, not assets, but liabilities. And that's primary residence, car, and clothes. Um, just to explain it briefly, primary residence, why is that not an asset and it's, in fact, a liability? Well, first of all, no one really owns their home. Why? Uh, property taxes. If you pay money, for something that you own to a third party, um, you don't really own that then. So suddenly that's a liability and not just property taxes, but also if you haven't fully paid off your house, you probably have interest payments that you have to make on top of that. Um, I believe in every state in the United States, you're required to have homeowners insurance as well. So um, actually primary residence is the exact opposite of an asset. It's one of the biggest liabilities you can ever have. Because um, all it does is suck money out of you every month. Um, a car, same thing. It deteriorates over time. As soon as you drive it off the lot, in fact, it drops in value. Um, so this is only a liability. You don't get any money from it unless uh, maybe you drive for Uber. That that can make it an asset. Um, or if you let your friends borrow it, I suppose, and charge them for it. Um, and then the other one is clothing. Again, you don't derive any income from this. Um, I believe there's companies where you can maybe lend out your clothing. In that case, that would be an asset. But um, I think when you think of primary residence or your car or your clothes, for most people, these are liabilities, not assets. OK, so now we'll cover a couple of the different asset classes um, that can uh, that can help you make money and, you know, live a good life and build on the current wealth that you either have already or that you want to to establish. So this shows the S&P 500, which is an index of uh, the 500 largest companies in the United States. Um, and it's very representative of, uh, of what's going on in the American economy. Um, it's composed of uh, the largest companies, Exxon, Amazon, Tesla, etc. Uh, and then another 497. So what's key when you're looking at personal finance, um, when you're looking at your assets and your net worth, you always need to think in terms of percentages. And this goes back to opportunity cost. Um, if I put my money in a savings account and they're telling me I'll get 3% over the course of a year. OK, well, that's a good data point. Now, what do I compare that to? Well, Warren Buffett targets 20% over the course of one year. Um, so here are a couple examples of uh, both 10 years and 50 year returns for the S&P 500. 
So you can see um, 2012, uh, it was at a level of about, I don't know what that is, 1200, 1300. Um, and today, I guess as of yesterday, actually on Friday, um, it reached 4,100. So the 10 year return of the S&P 500 is 202%. Um, that's not bad, that equals about 20% per year. So that $1,000 invested back then would be just over $3,000 today. Not bad. Um, and then the 50 year return is, uh, is quite astounding. Um, and for those of you that know your history, um, 50 years ago uh, was just after um, Richard Nixon removed the United States um, from the gold standard. And as a result, we now have all of these floating currencies around the world. Um, so over 50 years, there was a return of 3,900%, which means that $1,000 uh, invested back then in 1972 uh, would be $40,000 today. I also uh, looked this up and these three companies, I've never heard of them, but I believe they're very good options for uh, not just for potential investors in, in Nigeria, but throughout Africa. Um, and they're XTB, Capital.com, and uh, Admirals. So if you're interested in opening a brokerage account, uh, these are three good options. Um, I believe they're all online brokerages with, uh, with decent customer service, uh, which is important. And those would allow you to trade stocks. So um, this is another asset class, which uh, I imagine some of you are familiar with. If you're not, uh, you should really familiarize yourself with, uh, with gold and precious metals in general. So let me read Peter Schiff's quote here. We're on a collision course for disaster. All we can do is brace for disaster. Buy gold, get as far away as you can from US currency and the US economy. So Peter's quite bearish on, uh, on the future of both the American economy as well as the uh, American dollar. So here, um, this is another chart uh, specifically for gold comparable to the S&P 500 one, um, also going back to 1972. And here we see something interesting. 10 year return, not nearly as impressive as the S&P 500. If you remember the S&P 500 returned just over 200% in the last 10 years here, uh, gold returned only 18% as measured in US dollars, so not quite as impressive. However, look at the 50 year return. Um, the S&P 500 was less than 4,000%, whereas this 50 year return for gold is 4,100%. So it really depends on when you're measuring the data, and this is where it gets messy if you start cherry picking data, but um, this goes back to that argument that people make about gold, which is in the very long run, um, A, it maintains your wealth as, as the currency is destroyed by the central banks um, get devalued, but then B, uh, in this case, it actually beat the S&P 500 which is, uh, again, the index that everyone uses um, for comparison purposes um, to the economy, but then to the stock market as well. Um, on the previous slide, there's a quote from Warren Buffett saying that most people should just invest in the S&P 500. Uh, at least if you look at the last 50 years of return, it would have been better to invest in gold rather than the S&P 500. So here's Robert Kiyosaki again. Uh, again. Uh, he says, your house is not an asset, but a house can be an asset if it cash flows. Um, so buying a house and wishing for its value to increase is not investing. That's speculating. Uh, most people say, well, there's a limited amount of land and therefore uh, demand can only go up because people, the population continues to increase and they're not making any more land. So real estate will always go up. Well, I think we should all know that that's definitely not true. Um, we had a massive 
financial crisis as a result of the housing bubble popping in 2007, 2008. So we know that the price, the, I guess home prices uh, do not always go up. There are corrections, they ebb and flow just like everything else. So buying a house is not an investment. Um, here's some deep, an example I talked about earlier with the mortgage. You have your principal, which is the actual value of the house. Um, and then you have interest and property taxes and homeowners insurance. These are all additional costs that are adding zero value to you. And really they're just, I guess, sucking you dry of your money um, to cover these costs that uh, they aren't providing you with any value. Now, buying a house and then renting some or all of it does change the house from a liability to an asset. Um, and that's the kind of real estate that Robert Kiyosaki likes. Um, however, again, going back to the concept of opportunity cost, what does that look like? And most real estate investors that you ask are targeting five to 10% per year uh, in terms of income stream. So again, compared to a savings account, okay, not bad. Compared to what Warren Buffett targets or what the average return of the S&P 500, maybe not such a good return. And it's a huge asset that locks up a lot of your cash. All right, so I can't talk about uh, financial independence in 2022 without, of course, discussing cryptocurrency. And uh, I don't know if you probably couldn't see, but I actually have a, a Bitcoin polo on. Uh, this is a, a polo from uh, the Bitcoin.com store, which is uh, famously worn by Roger Veer, actually, who I who I've quoted here. <clears throat> so he says, Bitcoin is one of the most important inventions in all of human history. For the first time ever, anyone can send or receive any amount of money with anyone else anywhere on the planet conveniently and without restriction. It's the dawn of a better, more free world. Uh, that's Roger Veer, who's sometimes known as Bitcoin Jesus, um, who was a very early proponent and user of, uh, of Bitcoin. So um, you have Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum is a very other popular cryptocurrency, and then there are over 10,000 currently listed on CoinMarketCap. So the market is very large, um, and yeah, you have uh, your your pick as to which one you want to touch and research and all that. Um, I liked cryptocurrency many years ago. Um, I bought Bitcoin. I bought Ethereum. Um, yeah, many years ago. But um, something important to know is the right time to buy, whether it's cryptocurrency or anything else, gold, uh, growth stocks, value stocks. You buy them when, well, you should buy them when people are not interested in them, because when they are interested in them, you're probably too late. When, when the, uh, I don't know, when your taxi driver or when your aunt at dinner start talking about a certain idea of where to put money, it's probably too late because that means the crowd has already moved in that direction and, uh, and you've probably missed your opportunity. So here in this graph, you can see there were several interesting opportunities to get into Bitcoin. And this is very strange for such a new asset class. Um, but you can see that, uh, well, basically any time before 2016 would have been a fantastic time to buy cryptocurrency. Um, at the end of 2017, that was a, a huge rally, which is when Bitcoin got on a lot of people's radar uh, and then it crashed. And if you look closely, it really didn't do anything um, until about the outbreak of COVID. So if you had bought in December 2017, um, it took, I guess, about two years for you to watch your net worth in cryptocurrency plummet and stay flat and then not return to the value that you bought it at for two years that's a long time and uh very difficult particularly if you're uh, an emotional trader so i think there's still um room 
for you to have this kind of asset class uh, in your overall basket of assets. Uh, but I wouldn't put too much. I don't know what the future of cryptocurrency looks like. Um, there are a lot of bulls out there. I used to be. I'm wearing a Bitcoin shirt, but uh, proceed with caution. Okay, and finally, I can't uh, I can't finish this presentation without addressing um, the value of books. Books are critical in order to build up that base of knowledge, as I mentioned before, um, because you can really learn a lot from books. Typically, uh, I guess I love the books that are written by um, men and women that have already lived their lives, they've had their whole careers, and they're reflecting back on their lives, trying to make sense of what they did, what worked, what didn't work. So as a result, I love autobiographies. Um, I think you can learn a tremendous amount in a rather concise amount of space. Um, and each book you should consider almost like a, a course in college or even more than that because they're so invaluable. Um, as well as history books, uh, we can't know, we can't learn from our mistakes and we can't know where we're going if we don't understand where we came from. So that's why I like history books as well. Uh, economics, finance, these are key to understanding um, the role of money in society, um, how money flows, uh, where we should invest it, um, how to be successful. That way we can uh, live the kind of lives that we like to live. Science fiction is a rather interesting one, and I recently added it as a genre uh, that it's almost a go-to now because it tends to predict uh, what life might look like. Um, most people that don't read science fiction view it as kind of fantasy and just, you know, taking us out of this world so that we can escape and, you know, read something interesting. But uh, Doug Casey actually likes to say that most science fiction writers, they tend to imagine some sort of dystopia. And in some cases, they actually are forecasting what life might become. And that uh, that can be quite scary. So it's uh, it's instructive. I think if you look at a history book, it teaches you where we were, and then a science fiction book, uh, you can either prepare accordingly, or maybe you can work toward trying to avoid uh, society moving in towards of the, those kinds of dystopias. And then last but not least, self-help, or uh, I prefer the term personal growth, because self-help sounds kind of, I don't know, kind of a squishy uh, description of a genre, in my opinion. But uh, personal growth, books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, as well as different kinds of books that help you um, understand what motivates you, what makes you tick. Um, personal finance can sort of fit in there as well. Um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That's another example of a, of a self-help or personal growth book. Uh, but those books are fantastic as well, because, again, if, if you pick the right ones, you can learn a tremendous amount uh, from each of these genres. OK, let me check on the time here. OK. Um, so asset allocation. I covered a bunch of different asset classes and opportunities for investment. So asset allocation is the concept of how to structure your overall portfolio. Um, so theoretically, you start with cash and then you determine how to deploy that cash into these different asset classes. So these are three um, rather popular um, authors and analysts um, that have each given their ideal asset allocation strategy. Um, this is Bill Bonner. Uh, he wrote a newsletter for many years. He also wrote another book called Hormageddon. Uh, Jim Rickards, who's the uh, famous author who wrote Currency Wars, as well as Peter Schiff, who's a, a very well-known gold analyst, as well as, um, I guess, anti-Bitcoin commentator. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and actually, to Steve Forbes' point with the quote above, you have to be nimble and know that what worked in one period may not work in another. This is one of the most uh, important 
I guess, thoughts and ideas that I have in this presentation, which is just because something worked last year does not mean it will work this year. Um, growth stocks have been extremely popular for the last five, six years. And this year we have seen a terrible, terrible return from the growth stocks. So again, what uh, what works sometimes doesn't work other times. From from 2012 to 2016 or 17, gold was a very ugly asset class to own because all it did was go down year after year after year. Um, now for the last four years or so, um, gold has been a great asset to have because it's increased um, in price, at least in US dollars by something like 80%. Um, so there's a couple interesting asset classes. Uh, you can see gold is quite prevalent in each of them. In Bill Bonner's, that would go under tangible assets, I guess. And look, you can even see Bill Bonner has a 1% allocation to cryptocurrencies. Um, there he factors in that if you buy just a small amount, um, it does have the opportunity to have this crazy moonshot upward. Um, but at the same time, it's a very speculative asset class, and that's why he's limiting it to 1%. Um, Jim Rickards has an interesting one with art in there at 10% of his portfolio. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see Peter Schiff. He's a very big fan of still investing in the stock market, but not in American companies because he has a very negative outlook uh, for the United States economy. Okay, and last but not least, uh, this is a nice quote from Jordan Peterson. The most appropriate way to understand something is to try it. I think this is the, uh, well, let me rephrase, the trap that most people fall into is they read, they talk to their friends, their family, they watch videos on YouTube, and they try to understand things, but then they freeze and they don't know what to do, so they never make a move, take a risk. Unfortunately, you cannot better your place in life without taking a risk. If you don't take a risk, nothing will change. Um, if you take a risk, try something, you might fail, but you might succeed. And regardless, you'll probably learn something. So in my opinion, you have to get out there, take a risk, and try this. Don't go uh, all in, as they say. Uh, it's a Las Vegas gambling phrase. But, you know, put practice with a little bit, whether... Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the currency in Nigeria, but if it's uh, you know one, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, but try something, see how these different asset classes move. Um, and here are some actionable ideas uh, that I want to leave you with, so that you can you know start taking advantage and and trying to do what you can to to build your personal wealth. So open a brokerage account. I mentioned those three banks earlier uh, that are rather popular in Africa. Um, open a crypto trading account like Coinbase, buy gold, buy Bitcoin, and those three books at the bottom, I think, are a fantastic um, set of books. Speculator <clears throat> and Atlas Shrugged are actually, actually both fiction books, but I think both provide fantastic uh, philosophical educations. Um, that's all I have. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions.